Hey ladies, thanks for joining me today. So, I have a question. Have you ever read, read Matthew 28, 18 through 20 and had that like aha moment? Let's read it together. If you have your Bibles, please open to Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Um, and if you have a pen and paper nearby, you might want to take notes. So I'll give you a second to get there. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of age. So after reading this scripture, have you ever thought, oh, that's what I'm supposed to be doing? Or like, I finally found my purpose. God has entrusted us to a high calling. We are called to be disciples and go and make disciples. And um, in 2 Corinthians 5.20, we are called ambassadors for Christ. Now, that's a very high calling. I mean, that means we're called to represent Christ to the world. And that starts by following the command um, in Matthew to go and make disciples. I'm telling you, this biblical perspective changes everything. It changes why we go to church. It changes why we even engage with people. It changes um, why we befriend people. It changes um, why we even love on people. I mean, it changes our focus completely and what we even live for. So if you've had your eyes open to this truth, um, if you've learned that we're called to disciple, um, if you've accepted that you are a disciple of Christ and you know what it means to be a disciple, then this teaching is for you. We are going to talk about how to disciple with joy, even though you might feel scared, overwhelmed, or even frustrated at times. So let's start with being scared. Think about why you might be scared to disciple. Most people would say they feel inadequate. Like, I don't know enough. I will mess it up. I'm just going to say something wrong. Those thoughts will lead to feelings of feeling inadequate. Our thoughts lead to our feelings. We have to always be sure that we're living with a biblical perspective and not a worldly perspective. Because when our thoughts stand on truth, which is a biblical perspective, our feelings will follow and we'll feel at peace and we'll feel accepted, we'll feel adequate, like the things that the Bible tells us. So the truth is, we all have something to share, ladies, and it, even if it's just our testimony. Um, let me read this to you. Luke 8, 39, I'm sorry, 38 and 39. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Isn't that so cool? So just start there. Declare to the world what Jesus has done for you. Ladies, I know it's scary at first, um, but we learn as we do ministry. Please don't think that we learn eventually to do ministry. It just doesn't work like that. Um, actually, in this awesome book that I'm reading, by um, it's by Robbie Gallaty, and it's called Replicate. It says, quote, ministry is the pathway to maturity. And I found that to be so true. We learn so much more as we do ministry. Um, so now for all you ladies, please, please hear me. Don't believe the lie that you're inadequate. We all have something to share, but it's very, very important that we commit to daily learning. And what we don't know, we search out the answer to. It is a beautiful journey of never ending learning. Don't be afraid to say that you don't know something. Seriously, we'll never know everything. So we just need to stop thinking that we have to have all the answers. People know that we don't know everything. So just be real, say, I don't know, but well, let's find out together. It's so fun searching out answers together. Um, so just focus on sharing what you do know. It's that easy. Remember, we mature as we do ministry. So don't be scared. Um, I, I want to remind you of something. What did Jesus do when he was tempted? What did he do? 
He said, it is written. He spoke scripture to the enemy. He spoke scripture to the enemy. How often do we imitate Jesus in this way? We should do this every time we're tempted, even with just these lies that I'm talking about. And when we hear or feel that we're not adequate, we can, um, and what, I mean, we can, and what we really should do is speak scripture to the enemy, just like Jesus did. Say it out loud. Who cares if you look crazy? You know that um, our fight is not against flesh and blood, right? It's against the rulers of this world. Um, remember this scripture? Ephesians six twelve says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Then it goes into the armor of God, but how often do we take that seriously and put that armor on each day we go to battle? Ladies, it's not hard to see that we are in a spiritual battle daily. So we need to remember that um, the armor that we've been given, um, use the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God that we have been given. It wasn't go I wasn't going to actually read um, the whole armor of God, but let's remind ourselves of the armor we've been given. It's seriously so powerful. Um, let's read that. So we're going to go to Ephesians 6, uh, 13 through 18. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, like I was just saying, which is the word of God praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And um, also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the, mis mis the mystery of the gospel. Um, I just love, I love that we have armor. So let's use scripture to combat the enemy. Every time you have those thoughts that lead to feelings of inadequacy, and it will happen, you can recite this scripture um, that I'm going to give you. But you have to believe it. You have to trust it to be true. Okay? So in 2 Corinthians, you may want to write this one down, 2 Corinthians 3, 5, it says, Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. It's God that makes us sufficient. I'm so glad for that because I know without God, I am so insufficient. Um, any confidence that I have comes from Christ. I am not confident without him. Ladies, seriously, I don't have the best skills as a teacher. I don't think anyway, but the Lord has given me the heart to teach. So, I mean, I've been doing training um, to have better skills, but trust me, if it wasn't for the Lord calling and preparing me and give me the confidence, I just wouldn't do it. Um, this is not easy for me. Um, it doesn't just come natural for me at all. Um, it's really quite a bit of work actually putting material together to teach on, but really it's such a beautiful time uh, spent studying and relying on God and it's hours of prayer and gathering material. Now, I'm just sharing this with you because I want you to see that it's God that gives us the strength to do anything. This is all God leading and guiding and directing me to exactly what to teach on. He will do the same for you. Here's another scripture um, that you can recite when you're thinking and feeling inadequate. Um, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Okay, so 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. So Jesus says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfect 
is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, I am strong. So me explaining this whole teaching thing is really me boasting about my weakness um, and being content with them. I mean, knowing God will be my strength. These scriptures changed my heart um, from feeling inadequate to knowing God is my strength. Doesn't that truth just bring so much peace? Knowing that God will still work through us, even when we're weak, even when we don't feel adequate, even when we're scared to do something, even when we mess up, he will use it for good. I mean, we'll be humbled, but we will become stronger. Now that's beautiful truth. That's really a win-win. So what is there to be afraid of? ladies. He will make sure something good comes out of all our efforts, whether it's in our hearts or someone else's heart. So I encourage you ladies, use these scriptures or find your own that specifically speak to the lies in your head that you hear and stand on them as 100% truth. Don't be manipulated by those lies. If you have surrendered your life to Christ, you have nothing to be scared of. God's got you in the palm of his hand. So we talked about feeling inadequate and that makes us scared to disciple. And I know there is more things um, that can give us the feeling of being scared, but inadequate tends to be on the top of most people's list. Um, but another reason we tend to not disciple is because we just feel like we don't have enough time, right? I mean, some of us have husbands and kids. We have friends and family and church family and church ministry stuff. We might have a 40 hour a week job. Um, I mean, we have grocery shopping and we have meal prepping and we have laundry and we have cleaning. Then we have like extracurricular stuff like running our kids all over God's country. Or maybe we like Netflix shows or Hulu shows. Um, or maybe we're crafty. I should say you're crafty because I'm not crafty, but maybe you're crafty. Um, you might have cricket projects or other crafty projects. Um, maybe you're a reader or you play sports or watch sports. There's just so much things available to us to fit into a 24 hour day, right? Truth is though, we all have 24 hours a day in 168 hours a week and we all have control to prioritize whatever we feel is important check out this verse okay luke 12 34 so luke 12 34 for where your treasure is there will your heart be also so what do we treasure do we treasure the word of God so much that we strive to live by it? Do we strive to follow the commands in scripture over everything else? Do we treasure it that much? So I hope you've already come to realize why discipling is so important, but if you just don't have the passion for it, I get it, okay? It took me years to really understand the importance too. So um, here's a time to get a pen and paper ready. I'm going to give you some really, really great reading material to look up. Um, really, this material is for anyone. So whether you have a passion for discipleship or not, you will, you certainly will after reading this material. Okay. So um, first, I wanted to share. Check out this series by Robbie Gallaty. It's called. Let me look at it here. It's called. Um, the first book is called Growing Up. The second book is called Bearing Fruit. The third book is called Firmly Planted. Now, it's a three book series and it, it's the really easy reads. So, and they're really, really put together well. So check out that series. Um, also check out Follow Me by David Platt. Multiply by Francis Chan. And I really, really enjoyed um, Jared Dodd 
has an amazing trilogy. So it's three book series called Dio. So it's a D-I-O. That's Discipleship, Immersion, Obedience. Um, and the last one I had wrote down was Greg Ogden did a book called Transforming Discipleship. Okay, so now I've just given you probably a year full of discipleship material. After you dig into these studies, your heart will long to teach what you, what you know about God. I promise. Okay, so um, let's talk about priorities. We must know biblically what take what um, takes priority over what, or we will only do what feels good. Really, I mean, our default is to just follow our human nature, and typically that is what feels good, what's easiest, right? So, biblical priorities are in this order. Number one is God. That has to be your number one priority. It has to be your priority for a da daily quiet time, daily prayer, being a continual learner, which is a student of the word, which is a disciple. Okay, so that is number one over anything else. Number two is our husbands. We are called to be an encouragement to them, to support them, to be a light to them, to, to be their helper. And oh, how I want to go down that rabbit trail, but I won't. That's a whole nother whole nother story or a whole nother um, study anyway. So stay on task, stay on task. Um, so number two is our husbands. Number three is our children. God entrusts us to teach them to be disciples. That is a very, very high calling. Number four is caring for our parents or extended family. Um, and it's very important caring for our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We are called to do that. Um, and then number five, I would say, is evangelism and discipleship. Everything else has to come after that. All these other things that we really like to do has to come after that. Um, now, let me just clarify. We may have seasons that we're taking care of elderly parents or disabled family members or something like that that keeps us from being able to disciple someone like on a regular basis. And of course, that's what we need to do in those times. Um, we might be in one of those seasons. So let me encourage you to keep your eyes open to every opportunity to share about Jesus. We surely can evangelize wherever we go. And when we do share with um, Christ with someone, pray that someone else will be put in that person's life to disciple them. Ladies, we are a team working together in this journey. All God asks is that we do our part. Um, so in whatever season we're in, remember, we're a team working towards one goal to glorify God. Um, and we glorify God by obeying his word. So um, just remember, we are vessels God uses to get his word out to the world. And we are the vessels he uses to walk, walk alongside each other, to be an encouragement to each other in this journey. Um, so back to priorities, the priority list. When we understand our priority, the, the priority list, the way he, he um, lays it out, it makes things so much easier, right? We don't have to stress about where our time is spent. God has given us a beautiful design for our priorities. Um, to go in depth on this subject would take a lot of time, but I wanted to give you something to look up. Um, check out gotquestions.org. Okay, so that's got questions.org, G-O-T, got questions.org. Look up the article called, um, uh, what should the order of priorities in our family be? S something similar to that. What should be the order of priorities in our family? This article gives such good scripture references. This is a whole teaching in of itself. So, so check out that article. If we live according to his standards, to God's standards, it takes the stress rate out of life. That's why God says, don't worry, over and over and over in his word. Living by his standards, really, like obeying his word, it brings freedom, ladies. Freedom. So, ladies, when we understand our priorities and understand our purpose and choose to live according to it, we will experience joy that the Bible describes, not just in discipling someone, but as a whole. 
you will find yourself to be less stressed and way less overwhelmed. Well, that leads perfectly into our next part. So let's move on. Let's talk about what causes us to feel overwhelmed when we disciple others. So we look around and see all the lost people and we wonder how do we possibly reach them all? We feel like there are so many people in our lives to share Jesus with and just so many people to, like, to just keep in contact with, right? It seems impossible to do it all. I know that's how I feel sometimes. So have you ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like, oh, I haven't reached out to this person or I should contact that person or I wonder how this person is doing or like, am I supposed to be discipling that person? It can be a constant battle as to how to just do it all. So many thoughts that cause us to feel overwhelmed. Remember, thoughts lead to feelings. So the answer to not feeling overwhelmed is simple. It's really all about having a biblical perspective. So truth is God is the heart changer, not us. God saves people, not us. God is the one who opens eyes to the truth. God is the one who opens the doors for us to share the gospel. God is the one who prepares hearts to hear the truth. God is the one who leads people to us to be discipled. Did you hear that? God is the one who leads people to us to be discipled. So with this biblical perspective, we don't have to feel overwhelmed, especially thinking that we're not doing enough. As long as we love on people that are in our lives, God will draw people he has called to us for us to disciple. Now, this doesn't give us an excuse to just sit back in our living room, you know, watching our favorite show or doing our crafts. And I'm speaking to myself too, ladies, please hear me, waiting for a knock at the door. That's not what I mean at all. We, um, we don't want to fall into like either ditch of being overwhelmed or just being lazy. Let's try to keep a biblical perspective and find like that middle ground that's truth. So when I say God will lead um, the people he has called, I mean, as we live life, as we love on people, as we invest in people, as we treat people with value, um, really as we choose to walk in the fruit of the spirit, as it explains, um, in, you know, Galatians 5, 22 through, uh, 24, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Um, so as we choose to live by walking in the fruit of the spirit, God will draw people into our lives. Um, so when we have a biblical perspective, um, that, God does the sending and the calling, and we only need to keep our eyes open and obey. We can see when God is opening the door for us, we will not be overwhelmed. When God wants us to like connect with someone specific, he will place them on our heart. He will lead us to ask specific people to like do Bible studies with us. And what's awesome, the specific people that he has prepared will join. And if the people that you were hoping would join don't, it's okay. They're not ready yet. All you have to do is pray for them. It's simple. It's not stressful. Um, but keep reaching out. I mean, without feeling stressed, keep reaching out, keep loving on them, keep praying for them. Um, it's easy to fall into the ditch of thinking, well, when they're ready, they'll reach out. I can just sit back and kind of wait around kind of thinking. And that's not a complete biblical view. Um, it's them reaching out, yes, but while we listen to the Holy Spirit's leading as to when we need to reach out. So that's why I say keep our eyes open. Um, don't just fall into that ditch, you know, and, and think it's all on them. Um, I hope I made that clear. So it's both. Um, so to wrap up this part, when we feel overwhelmed, our perspective is wrong. Want to know how I know that to be true? Because in Matthew 11:30 it says, your yoke, or I'm sorry, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Um, we need to evaluate what is causing us to feel overwhelmed. Are we doing too much? Are we trying to control something that isn't in our control? Um, 
what are we thinking that's causing those feelings? Then turn to Jesus, go to prayer, and back to scripture. So when we feel overwhelmed, we can remember um, this scripture. Um, it's Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You can see um, that this is a powerful verse for me. The Lord showed me that when I finally understood what his yoke is, which is my purpose, and I stopped trying to control the things that are really in his control, I found the rest that this verse is talking about. I'm way less overwhelmed. And when I start down that road again, um, I go back to Jesus, I pray, I stand on scripture as my truth over whatever I'm feeling. I wanted to share how I used to take the control and not allow his yoke to be light. Let me be clear, this is just my thoughts and my experiences, okay? Um, I used to go out looking for that perfect person, like, who should I disciple? Maybe this person because they're fun and easy to get along with, or maybe that person because they struggle so much, or um, maybe this person because they're my friend. We tend to gravitate toward um, what's easy, don't we? I mean, maybe that's just me again, but um, all we have to do is keep our eyes open. It's so simple. We're the ones that make it difficult. So what do I mean by keeping our eyes open? Here are, I'm gonna give you two specific ways to keep your eyes open. Number one, who is coming to church that is only a consumer right now? I mean, God led them there for a reason. This is where the Lord has really been working on my heart. I have such a heart for those who come and then we rarely see them. There is a reason that they were there or are there. Maybe God is calling them. We need to reach out and see, okay? That's my number one reason. Now, number two, who is in your life right now that you can see them seeking God, even if it's like the littlest way? Maybe they're asking questions, maybe they're asking you questions, or um, at least they listen to you when you talk about God. Then start praying. Pray that God leads the people that he is calling for you to disciple. Then try to build a relationship with those people. Um, you know, like those people that are just consumers at church at, at that time, or that are asking questions about God, just become their friend. Seriously, it's that simple. Then just keep your eyes open and watch God work. It's seriously the most beautiful thing to see. Can you see that this approach is so much more freeing? When I learned this truth, I stopped trying to find the right people. God has brought them right to me. As I keep my eyes open, and yes, seek out those who look as if they're seeking God, I'm no longer overwhelmed. Um, another thought, sometimes we even limit God, right? And say, well, I can only disciple one person at a time. But let me share this experience too. Um, there have been times that I've started feeling overwhelmed by how many people I had in my life that I was discipling in one way or another. I felt like I was answering questions all the time um, and being their support, um, you know, no matter what time of the day it was, whenever they called. Um, that can start feeling overwhelming. Does anybody else know what I mean by that? Um, but I've seen God work in this too. God will allow people to pull away and others to continue forward. Sometimes people would be drawn to another person. And in time, I find that um, someone else is discipling that person. And you know what's so funny? Guess what we think when that happens? I must not be good enough. Why is that person better than me? Um, I know I knew I wasn't good at this discipleship stuff then how do we feel? Inadequate again. Thinking leads to feelings. Stop listening to those lies. God is working on our behalf. Actually, he knows what is good for us. So just let him work and push those lies out of your head. Praise God that he sees us and knows our limits. Praise God that he loves us that much. 
Um, that's God working in our life so personally. We don't have to feel that if someone stops reaching out, that it must have been like an issue with us. God knows how much we can handle and he will handle it. All we need to do, keep our eyes open, surrender our time to God, and he will lead. Um, so let's move on. Then there might be times where we're that type of person that we just take on too much. And sometimes we don't even realize um, that the more important priorities are hurting. We might not even necessarily feel overwhelmed. Um, and this is where we need to be evaluating our lives. You know, like, is our relationship with God healthy? Is our relationship with our husband healthy? Um, is our relationship with our kids healthy? Is our relationship with our family and church family healthy? If we can say no um, to any one of these, we might have to step back, maybe delegate the people that are in our lives that are seeking discipleship to another person who's willing to disciple. We really have to remember our, our priorities. Um, another reason we can feel overwhelmed is that we think it's what we say that will change people. Let me explain um, with an example. So I was new to this idea of discipleship. Um, I had a friend who came to Jesus. I discipled her very loosely because I was new myself. Um, I was never trained how to disciple someone. I would say we live life together, you know, more than we really dug into the Bible. I mean, we did do um, some Bible studies together, of course, but our focus wasn't um, learning how to obey Jesus' command like it says in Matthew. Um, so time went on. She chose to walk away, um, not only from God, but from her family and from me. It completely broke me completely broke my heart. Um, I felt like I was a failure. I felt like I was, um, I mean, I felt like it was because of me that she fell away because I wasn't teaching her well enough. I felt like, um, I can't do this discipleship stuff. Um, so I would text her numerous times a day with no response from her. One day, um, I went to see her and because I was so frustrated with myself and with her, I didn't love her well my feelings came out in anger. I was just so angry that she would walk away from her family. I was so angry that she'd walk away from our friendship. I felt like it meant nothing to her. I was so angry um, that she would walk away from God. So we got into it, full blown argument, to the point that she locked herself in the bathroom. Because I was not living with a biblical perspective, I felt hurt and angry. Not having a biblical perspective leads, leads to awful feelings. I kept thinking, if she would only listen to me. I had went through um, a similar experience in my past where I had walked away from everything too. So I knew how she was feeling, but I couldn't get over the feeling that if she would just listen to me. I thought it was my words that would do the changing. Again, not a biblical perspective. It drove me crazy. Um, after that face-to-face -face -face encounter, I still texted her daily, numerous times a day, hoping she would listen to something I would say. Well, one day while I was working, I started to feel overwhelming anxiety. My heart was racing. I couldn't even take a deep breath. At that moment, God spoke to my heart and he said something like, you are not the one that will change her. At that moment, I completely broke down. I knew, I knew I had to let her go. I texted her um, for the very last time. Then I gave up control. It was so painful at first, but so freeing in the end. God showed me so many truths um, going through that. He is in control. It's not what we say that changes people. We are only the seed planters. We need to let um, God take control 
Um, and we will feel the freedom that comes from that. Now, really quick, here's a good example of allowing God to be in control and um, allowing God to lead people that he's calling. Um, my husband has been working with a guy um, for a long while, and they became pretty good friends, even though this guy is not a Christian. My husband would bring up God when there was an open door, and this guy would listen and not fight back. Too much, anyway. So... We started to hang out with this guy and his wife, off and on, of course, with all intention to share Jesus with them, but trying to not be too pushy, you know, um, always waiting for the door to be open. But we would bring up God, whatever it seemed like the door was open though. Then they started asking questions. Then we offered to do Bible studies with them. Then they chose to start attending church. My past approach would have been get them to church so they hear the gospel. But I learned that it's our job to share the gospel and our pastor's job to equip, to equip us. I mean, yes, don't get me wrong, pastors still should share the gospel, um, but their main focus should be equipping us as disciples to go and share the gospel and make disciples. So let's move on. Finishing up, frustration. So let's finish up with why we get frustrated while discipling. On some level, we should expect that we will get frustrated at times. Um, as scripture says, I wanted to share this with you. Um, it's Luke 10, um, 16. The one who hears you hears me. The one who rejects you rejects me. And the one who rejects me rejects him who sent me. So, um, as we disciple others, we will be sharing in Christ's sufferings. And really, that's a very minor in sharing in his sufferings. But really, the question is, is our frustration showing a part of our heart that's not quite right? We'll get back there. So think about it. Why do we get frustrated? Here's one reason. Um, sometimes we want so badly that people will listen and choose to follow Jesus and they don't. Sometimes we want it for people more than they want it for themselves and it is frustrating, I know. But the truth is their eyes have not been opened yet and it's just not God's timing at that moment. So we need to pray, um, wait to see an open door. Um, we don't give up on them. I mean, never give up on them. Do not allow your frustration to give up on them and make it make yourself feel like it's hopeless. Remember, negative thoughts will lead to those negative feelings. Um, when we're frustrated, what are we feeling? What are the thoughts that we're having? Why are we frustrated? What are the expectations that we're having that are not being met? That's the question we need to answer, and we're going to. But um, let's talk about like another reason that we get frustrated. Um, maybe we encourage people to do something and they don't do it. Anyone else get frustrated with that? You know, maybe we, we encourage them to read their Bible or just, you know, do a Bible study. Maybe we encourage them to seek out forgiveness or encourage them to surrender something. Um, and when we get back with them, they haven't done it, or maybe just a very little, or even just enough to say that they've done something. And then they will come up with all kinds of excuses why they didn't get to it. Does anyone else get frustrated in those times? I know it can't just be me. This is our human response when people don't listen to us or follow through. But we have to remember, all people are different. Some are very, very new believers. Um, some have no foundation in God at all, or a very, very broken one. Um, some have very bad theology. Um, some have had experience in their lives that have molded them in a certain way, and so on. So to disciple, we will have to keep our expectations low and our grace very high. Did you hear that? To disciple well... We have to keep our expectations low and our grace very high. Really, 
Our focus needs to be on our own heart and being that person in their life that resembles Christ. So how patient are we? Are we showing grace? Are we loving well? So let's be patient, show grace, love well, encourage them to do what is beneficial for them, but when they don't and it will happen, encourage them and please don't lay on guilt trips, okay? Guilt trips never work. Encourage and never guilt trip them. I know that some of us just have that um, subconscious um, speaking guilt trips and we don't even realize it. So I thought it would be beneficial to highlight these like kind of guilt trip actions um, just so we can be aware. And trust me, guilt tripping people does not work. I've tried it, tested and proven not to work. So for example, if someone doesn't do what you asked or shows up unprepared, guilt tripping speaking might sound like, well, I asked you to finish that or how come you didn't prioritize time? Um, or we might say something like, it wasn't that much reading or that much work to do. Um, we might say, it was really easy. Or you have to prioritize time. Or maybe we might even think, do you really even want to follow Christ? Even our body language, as you can tell, um, can project guilt. So like the rolling our eyes or the uh, size, you know, or even that like just disappointed tone, like, okay. So ladies, try to steer clear of these types of responses in this body language. I know it's tough to control our body language. My hardest one is to control the, like the, that was stupid face, you know, like the, that kind of face like this. <laughs> I've actually thought that maybe I can justify getting Botox, like just, just right here, just right here, just so I can't make that face, this face, the face. <laughs> Man, we can justify anything if we try hard enough, right? <sighs> anyway, sorry for that tangent. So, we just have to remember, <laughs> Ladies, we're here to encourage, to be a light, and to plant seeds. So good responses can be, hun, that's okay. Life is crazy. I find that if I don't do my quiet time in the morning, it's probably not going to get done. Or we could say something like, this is a journey, not a sprint. Or we could say, I'm here to walk through this with you. Um, sometimes I even say, hun, there is always tomorrow. Um, we could even say... The Lord has a beautiful life in store for you. So please, please remember to encourage and not give out guilt trips. Allow that person to see what they should be doing by our example. Just love them and guide them, answer their questions, and be that support that they need. Um, so there will be times in discipleship relationships or discipleship groups that people will need to be held accountable to a higher accountability. But first, developing a relationship with that person is priority. We need to know, or I'm, no, actually, they need to know that you love them. And when you are holding them accountable, it's purely out of love and, out of, and not out of condemning them. So developing a um, solid relationship is important before you think that, that you have the responsibility to hold them accountable. I found that you'll know when it's time to hold someone more accountable. When they ask for it, as they mature in Christ, they will learn that being held accountable um, is for their own good and they will welcome it. So be patient, show grace and love on them. Now, I know there are so many more reasons um, as to why we can get frustrated. I could be here probably all day. But my goal is to show you how to find joy in discipling. And yes, you can disciple and not allow frustration to lead you to react in a worldly way. And in time, your frustration gets less and less because a biblical perspective leads to peace. 
So now, what causes us to get frustrated? Think about it. What causes us to get frustrated? Isn't it because our expectations are not being met in one way or another? Doesn't our frustration show that we think our timing is better than God's? Doesn't our frustration show that we think we are the heart changers? Doesn't our frustration show um, that people should listen to us? And I'm sure there are many other things that our frustration says about our own hearts. But we have to remember that the person we are discipling is not the only person learning. God is showing us how to show grace. God is showing us how to be patient. Um, he is showing us how to love well. Um, he's showing us that his timing is best. He is teaching us too. So my encouragement when you feel frustrated, and I mean frustrated about anything, ask yourself, why? Why are you feeling that way? And what is God trying to teach me? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. So let's wrap this up. But first, can I share one more story with you all? This is really how I learned this whole lesson. I had a friend that struggled so badly with depression. Um, she became, or we became very close and I made it my mission to help her. I tried everything. Well, I thought I tried everything back then. Um, but year, and year, year after year would go by and I wasn't seeing growth. I became so frustrated because I wasn't seeing the growth I was expecting. So I gave up. I felt like I was no longer any help anyway and I just gave up. My frustration led me to give up. That's not from the Lord because my expectations were not being met. I felt like a failure. I felt like she wasn't really trying and I just gave up. I know now that frustration was and is my issue, but my negative thoughts led to negative feelings, which led to those negative actions. And it led me to give up. That is the world or worldly response to frustration. Biblical response is turning to Jesus and evaluating our own heart. Well, she's no longer here with us today. And I am still broken that I allowed my feelings to take control and lead me to give up. But I learned a life changing lesson. I can't expect others to grow in my timing. I can't allow my unmet expectations to cause me to give up. I learned my grace was not larger than my expectations. I learned that I can't expect people to change just because I'm speaking truth to them. Change comes from God. I learned to stop focusing on others and why they frustrate me. And I learned to evaluate my heart in those moments and seek out why I'm frustrated or overwhelmed or scared. I start asking myself, what truth am I not truly believing? Like what truth am I not standing on? What, what is causing me to feel this way? For me, it was not trusting God's timing, wanting to see my efforts make a change and high expectations and low grace. I needed to learn how to love like God loves. I'm so thankful that he doesn't give up on me. So when we're feeling frustrated, God is showing us the part of our heart that is not in line with his. He's showing us that we need work as well. Frustration comes from our will not being met. Ouch, I know that hurts. When I realized this, it changed my thinking completely, which leads me to get frustrated way less. But when I do, instead of focusing on what is frustrating me, I look back at my own heart and I repent and joy comes. So if you take anything away from this teaching, I hope you heard, we can disciple and even just live life without responding in a worldly way. When we feel scared, frustrated, or overwhelmed, we need to allow those feelings to lead us to Jesus and directly to the word that speaks truth. We are not perfect. So we will have these feelings at times and they will creep in, remember, Call on Jesus in prayer, 
and use scripture to combat those lies. Recite scripture over and over. Write them down so you can see it all the time. If you dedicate yourself to this, you will find freedom. It's really all about having a biblical perspective, knowing who's in control and that we are just the seed planters um, that encourage and that teaches others to obey God's commands. That's what we're called to do. Now, ladies, pray for God to lead those ladies to you that he has called to himself. Keep your eyes open. Surrender your time, and you'll see that discipling brings you more joy than you could have ever imagined. Now, I understand what the Bible was talking about when it says you can have joy. Psalm 1611 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forever. Thank you for sticking with me to the end. Now go and make disciples. Lord God, thank you so much for your word. Lord, thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for loving us so perfectly. Lord, I just um, pray that any lady that heard this teaching, that it just, um, that it pierced her heart and that she sees a new way of living, a new um, refreshed way of living for you, for a beautiful purpose. Give us boldness to go out and make disciples as you have called us to do. Thank you, Lord God. We are here living life to serve you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.